The Fatui Harbingers are one of the two main antagonists of Genshin Impact. Throughout the story, they've proven time and time again that they will stop at nothing to achieve their goals. Whether it be killing a whole civilization, testing on the innocent for their own personal goals, or even showing hostility towards their own Fatui. This video is the first part of the two-part Harbinger special, so keep a lookout for the next one as well. Today, we're going to be discussing and theorizing about the potential characteristics, design, numbers, names, and constellations of all 11 of the Fatui Harbingers. I would like to preface this video is just a theory, and that it should not be indicative of any final product. If I am wrong, then I am wrong. The Commedia dell'arte is Italian for comedy of the profession, and is an Italian theatrical form that was prevalent in the 18th century due to the usage of many colorful pantomimes and stock character stereotypes. The Commedia, unlike other forms of theater, focuses more on improvisation and acting, which is why most sets are minimalistic. But one key aesthetic of the actors of the Commedia are the usage of masks for all actors save for two rules. The origins of the Commedia dell'arte date back as far as the 16th century. But today, however, the Commedia dell'arte is a lost art. The Fatui Harbingers are based off of stock characters found in the Commedia dell'arte, so that's where we'll begin our search. Let's begin with the scope and the limitations of this theory. If you've ever been interested in the Fatui, you would have seen this picture around by Reddit user Saltazier. Credit where credit is due. However, after seeing 2.1, we know that the constellations in the wheel are not ordered, as we saw Senora is number 8, but her constellation is the moth next to Tartaglia's whale. We also know that the logic of the constellations is still unknown, so actually accurately pinpointing whose is what will be difficult. We also only know 9 Fatuis by name. Piero, Pulcinella, Scaramouche, Signora, Tartaglia, Capitano, Dottore, Pantalone, and Sandrone, which leaves 2 to be a mystery. So, with that, let's begin. Who are the 11 Fatui Harbingers? The first of the Fatui Harbingers, Piero, or the Jester. The constellation of the crying mask shows the fate of a young man who makes a mockery out of tragedy. In the Commedia, Pedrolino is a young and honest servant who was a victim of the pranks of his other comedians, and is known as the lovesick, pathetic clown whose melancholy and tragedy provided a stark contrast to the lovable clown we know today. I believe that the Harbinger Piero is actually a mix of two stock characters, the Pedrolino at first and slowly transitioning into the Arlecchino or the Harlequin. In Genshin, Piero's countenance of being a pathetic clown is seen in the Mocking Mask, in which he notes that his previous days were met with no attention by the people. There was a time that he was not listened to by the previous ruler of another land, since his level of learning could not compare with the sages. And with the people's ignorance, he failed to tear them away from the veil of sin and ushered the tide of divine wrath and destruction. After so, he swore allegiance to the Saritza and swore to laugh at the absurdities and the world's abhorrent principles. He was the one responsible for recruiting at least three of the other harbingers, Pantalone, Dottore, and the Lady of the Stainless Bloom, Senora. When observing how he states of the unknown land he was raised in, I believe that this is the cataclysm of 500 years ago. With how it was described, the land had powerful sages, and whatever was caused by the sin of humanity ushered divine wrath and destruction. If the land he was speaking of was Conria, then it would make sense why his ideals aligned with the Saritza, who allegedly was impacted by an occurrence 500 years ago. If he was raised in a kingdom that suffered because of the gods' punishment and the unjust ideals of Celestia, then his motivation and anger for the people refusing to listen to his tale would begin his journey to recruit those who were also wronged by the very ideals of Teyvat. Unlike his comedia counterpart, he takes great pleasure in invoking strong emotions in his colleagues, a scene with him sending Scaramouche to the meteors, and about him giving the Torre the ironic title of Doctor despite knowing he was chased out of Sumeru for his harmful experiments. Should the Traveler ever fight him, I believe that he will meet him at the end of his journey, where Aether has finally seen the reality of the gods' ideals based on the other six nations. It would be him that tries to coerce understanding from the Traveler to empathize with the Saritza's goal for true salvation. Because unlike the other residents of Teyvat, 
Wouldn't the traveler truly understand just how funny the world really is? The second to fourth harbingers are going to be theoretically interchangeable. However, they follow one key motif. Each are regarded as the more popular or prominent figures in the Commedia than the ones in the lower half of the Harbingers. The second Harbinger, Columbina. The name Columbina means little dove, which would make sense for the constellation of the crying dove shaped like a heart. The reason why I believe that Columbina is one of the missing Harbingers is firstly because of the archetype. Columbina from the Commedia is a peasant servant character playing the tricky slave archetype. She is the wife of Pierrot and the mistress of Harley Quinn. She is known as the only functional intellect on the stage and is quick-witted and prone to knowing everything about everyone. She is down to earth and would make a fantastic consigliere in concert for the Harbingers. If I were to make a guess, Columbina in game would be the second in command of Piero, and while they wouldn't most likely be lovers, she could still play a great influential role in the Harbingers as his closest colleague. It would make a good transition if she were the one spearheading the recruitment and informing Piero which notable figures exist in the entirety of Teyvat. Her being a gossiper and intel gatherer would fit her archetype, and would make sense how Piero would know who to track down, especially ancient beings like the Crimson Witch of Embers. The third Fatui Harbinger, Pantalone, the Greedy Merchant. The constellation of the grasping hand is indicative of a young man who is holding on fiercely to material possessions solely because he has nothing else left to hold on to. In the Commedia, Pantalone was named by Carlo Goldoni as one of the four primary Commedia dell'arte characters. Pantalone is known for his insatiable avarice and status at the top of the social order. The character of Pantalone never forgets a deal and his merit is based on actions as well as a widower or single man that is always rejected by those he tries to court. This reflects well with the beginnings of the third Harbinger. In the story of Genshin Impact, we know that Pantalone was once an impoverished individual from the land of contracts. His lust for money was because he was once destitute, and that in his entire existence, not even the gods graced him with their favors. Therefore, he can only pursue worldly power. His anger for the gods stemmed from the fact that while the gods shouldn't have any need for something as worldly as money, they still hold it firmly regardless. Perhaps in his eyes, the gods are stealing from those that need it the most, and that's what burnt a sense of resistance within him. We know that he is a lavish spender and exercises the wealth he accumulated with unmoving care, so much so that he rented a whole hotel simply for the use of the Fatui in Mondstadt. When observing the Harbinger with the Commedia, the parallels are obvious. Pantalone respects contracts more than anything and upholds his contract with the Fatui by the name of money. He was also rejected by the gods and he was never granted a favor, also known as a vision. Therefore, if Pantalone would be an enemy, he would be the first character in the game without a vision but with a delusion that is still alive to this day. The fourth of the Fatui Harbingers Dottore, the doctor. The constellation of the relic tells the tale of a man cast aside by those who feared the knowledge he possessed. But nevertheless, he pursues to understand further in the name of science. In the Commedia, Dottore and Pantalone are comic foils of one another, with Dottore being the erudite against Pantalone's greedy habits. Il Dottore in the Commedia loves the sound of his own voice and is quite exaggerated in how he acts hacking into the trope of a mad scientist. He is a scholar and an intelligent man that plays into the trope of educated elite. In Genshin Impact, Dottori is the first Fatui Harbinger we ever meet in the franchise. He appeared as an antagonist in the main manga, and his antics and experiments are seen as abhorrent and monstrous. He spearheaded the production of enhanced humanity and the study of Archon Residue. He would experiment on innocent children as well as his own colleagues for his own advancement in science. His factory developing the ruin guards and studying them was also seen in Tartaglia's story quest, but it's also known that the foundation is abandoned seeing as Dottore lost interest. Dottore's regard for human life is almost non-existent. He has threatened others that should they be insufficient, then they will be his new experiments. He believes that all humans are nothing more than machines, with only an extended form of complexity. 
and that if he were to take a human apart and simply make enhancements to each limb or organ, then they can create a new being with unparalleled strength. This revelation was not well received by the people of his hometown, and he was chased out with pitchforks and torches. He was admitted into the Sumeru Academia. While at the Academia, he was recruited by Piero, who told him that the Fatui will fund the resources of his project. This is why I believe that Pantalone was recruited first before the Torre, regardless of the Torre's number, because there would be a need for the Fatui to establish themselves as a wealthy organization to convince the Torre. The Torre is a strong and cunning individual. He has made Mondstadt indebted to him by allegedly slaying Urs the Drake, and he has unsurmountable political power because of his position. Should the Traveler fight him, I believe that this would take place in Sumeru, and that when they meet, the Torre would be fascinated by the prospects of an individual who can not only control the elements without a vision, but also control them simultaneously. However, he is a criminal and a murderer. The epitome of scientific perversion and how gluttony can consume a person. We also know that he has to be higher than Scaramouche, who is sixth, because I doubt he, for all his talk of enhanced humanity, was not the person that worked on Scaramouche's prototype body. Harbingers 5 through 7 actually make me quite curious. In the Commedia dell'arte, Pulcinella and Scaramouche both have a history of their actors creating their own masks or developing ones that already pre existed. But there is another mask in the Commedia that also followed the same history which is why I'm putting them at number 7. The fifth of the Fatui Harbingers, Pulcinella, the Rooster. The constellation of the bird's mask represents the Commedia's long beak-like nose that Pulcinella's mask is known for. Pulcinella of the Commedia is a dualistic character who either plays ignorant or intelligent. In the Commedia, the Pulcinella is actually depicted in two different ways. The upper Pulcinella is described as a schemer and a proud individual. Pulcinella is known for his self-preservation, and most of his successes are very accidental or not necessarily his normal. Pulcinella is everyone's savior, saved by no one. Selfish, but his actions accidentally cause the betterment of others. Pulcinella is also known for being quite sadistic, but somehow makes it look like an accident because of how they usually cover it. This is reflected in how he allegedly saved Ajax and brought him into the position of power. We also see a sneak preview of Pulcinella in the character trailer amidst the other Fatui skirmishers. Pulcinella in Genshin Impact seems to be a counselor of some sorts. Pulcinella in Genshin Impact actually quite reflects the dualistic nature of his Commedia dell'arte counterpart. Pulcinella in the story states that Ajax should not be trusted. He also told Tartaglia under the pretense of a punishment that he should start from the very bottom if he wants to serve the Saritza. So perhaps Pulcinella isn't necessarily the benevolent figure we think they are. The sixth of the Fatui Harbingers, Scaramouche, the Balladeer. The figure with a heart signifies the doll that became more than human. The Scaramuccia in the Commedia dell'arte is known for being the little skirmisher and shows an assortment of antagonistic traits such as conceit, slyness, and arrogance. According to Wikipedia, he entertains the audience by his grimaces and affected language, and plays a sarcastic and supple archetype, which we very much clearly see in Genshin. The Scaramuccia is a fraudulent character, and often finds himself in difficult situations, but often finds his way out by making others suffer the brunt for him. In Genshin Impact, the Inazuman Harbinger is known for their brash personality and short height and temper. The Balladeer's name was once Kunikuzushi, meaning the destroyer of provinces, and he was the prototype puppet for the Raiden Shogun. Kunikuzushi at some point was a test vessel for the Electro Archon, a creature that was created through some divine means to protect her own eternity, a simulacrum of some sorts. However, it wouldn't be impossible to say that he was a field experiment, or simply was deemed inadequate by the god. It would also fit the fact that Escaramuchian used to be an altercation of the Il Capitano, originally before becoming his own character. Upon his dismissal, he was cast aside like worthless dross and left to wander the countryside of Inazuma for days to come until the Fatui found him. Perhaps through their own form of technologies, I believe that the Tori used what he knew from enhanced humans and unlocked whatever power was sealed in the Kunikuzushi, rebirthing the puppet into a being much stronger than the vessel he once was. His faith was to live a long life and a hollow will. But just like the Scaramuccia, 
he became much more. The seventh of the Fatui Harbingers is Il Capitano, the captain. Bearing the consolation of the three pikes, signifying one's might and tenacity. In the Commedia, Il Capitano, for all his worth, is actually not a captain, and is only some braggart with too much pride than intended. The reason why he is known to be the captain is because he tricks others that don't know any better, and makes them think he is bigger than they are. He is usually a Spaniard in the Commedia. Il Capitano, however, talks lengths about made-up conquests in order to impress others, but often only truly plays up an act or spectacle. When he gets too carried away and becomes poured into battle, he is the first one to run. Both he and Signora are known for their high posture and haughty nature, seeing as both are braggarts. If I had to make a guess, Capitano and Genshin would be a very loud individual that always brags about his rank as a harbinger or his strength or at least makes others feel lower than himself by constantly reminding them, either passively or otherwise, that he is a harbinger and they are not. But he would mask it in a way that is charismatic, like Tartaglia, rather than someone so straightforward like Scaramouche. Maybe this is why Victor would say he would rather work for Capitano rather than Signora. If I also had to make a guess, Il Capitano will appear in Natlan. The late Eighth Harbinger is La Signora, the mot signifying the form that she once took when she was once a maiden of the flames. Rosaline Krechka Lohrfalter was born in Mondstadt 500 years ago and was known for her fight against the monsters corrupted by gold. She fell in love with the bloodstained knight who unfortunately passed away during his fight against the monsters of calamity. As she mourned the loss of her love, she used the flames burning through her to cleanse the world of mortal and divine sin morphing her into the Crimson Witch of Embers. She was then found by Piero, the first Fatui who promised her that the Tsaritsa will extinguish the flames burning within her. It was at this moment that Rosalind became the Harbinger, La Signora. The ninth and tenth Harbingers are much harder to deduce, but while I do think that the ordering of the Fatui is measured by their strength, the next two will derive more from actual Commedia dell'arte inspiration rather than any in-game inference. The ninth harbinger, Brigella, is the instigator. The consolation of the hand with a spiral shows a person capable to take action, but isn't afraid to lead others down a rabbit hole of never-ending lies and conflict. In the Commedia dell'arte, the name Brigella translates to a nuisance or contention a man known for constantly instigating conflict due to his ability to lie and make rapid false claims for any situation. He is an inquisitive mastermind capable of using his wits and tact to get himself not only away from trouble but also drag other people into conflict by manipulating the situation. The reason why I believe Brigella would be one of the Harbingers is that firstly, they are a popular stock character, so such a title would be prevalent. The characteristics of the Brigella actually play similarly to Tartaglia's personality, except that Brigella would be more intentional with their lying. While they can fight, Brigella would use their words much more frequently in order to pin the blame on others. And what better place to introduce a character that is known for being a manipulative liar than the masquerade of the guilty? The tenth harbinger is Sandrone, the puppet and the consolation of the marionette shows a being hinged on strings in the trance of fate. Sandrone is more prevalent in the puppet theatrics rather than the Commedia itself, but in the Commedia, the mask represents the city of Modena. Sandrone is a peasant who has a lot of street smarts to him. While living in an impoverished lifestyle, Sandrone has a lot of witty comments and criticisms of those on the higher status. In Genshin, we don't actually see them except in Tartaglia's sigil of permission, where he is mentioned to have admonished Devert when he was a recruit, meaning that Sandrone themselves aren't necessarily a pleasant person to begin with. My biggest concern with their story, however, is that we already saw the puppet on the string's character arc from the game. Scaramouche himself already delivered on the artificial human creation theme, so having a repeat of that would be very repetitive. But I do think that they can still pull off the puppet storyline even with Scaramouche claiming the theme. Sandrone can easily just be a name, rather than them being a puppet themselves. Sandrone is a manipulator. Rather than being a puppet, they'd be the puppeteer. Perhaps that it's time to see a dual character where Sandrone uses a puppet to fight for them. 
Another take is that Sandrone can be an artificial human created by the Fatui Harbingers themselves. Piero would have been interested in the technology that created the Balladeer, so with that, he would have asked the Tora to put the Enhanced Human Project into fruition. We know that the Fatui Harbingers are capable of putting human remnants into inorganic constructs, and the Tora would have been given most of the knowledge he needed by the Harbingers. Therefore, creating artificial life themselves wouldn't be so difficult. If we ever do see this version of Sandrone then, I believe we'll see them in Sumeru rather than Fontaine, where he and the Tore would be the ones to terrorize the academia for being too afraid to realize what their true potential could achieve. Again, this is all just speculation, but speculating is fun. The 11th Harbinger, Tartalia. The Monoceros Kaile is a narwhal, the history of the young boy from the seaside village who turned into a massive weapon for destruction. Itax was born in the seaside village Morapiso, into a family of six. His parents, his sister Tanya, brother Anthon, and little brother Tuser. However, such a monotonous lifestyle wasn't Ajax's calling, and at the age of 14, he ran away with nothing but a bag of bread and a short sword. He ran through the snowy forests only to be lost. His footing failed him as he slowly fell into the bottomless cracks into the earth. And that is where he found the ancient world and the lost civilization. This is where he met Skirk, a mysterious swordswoman who taught him the way of the foul legacy. He returned to the surface after three days. However, there was a notable change in his demeanor. He began wanting to fight more and caused havoc and conflict wherever he went. That was when his father, worried for his son, had brought him to the conscription of the Fatui. His father had hoped that a strict military training of the Fatui could temper his son's lust for battle, but the results were far from desirable. The battle prowess of the young boy only caught the attention of the fifth harbinger, Pulcinella, who inducted Ajax into the harbingers and told him to start from the bottom on serving his duty to the Tsaritsa. And with that, those are the 11 Fatui harbingers both confirmed and speculated. But our little introspection into Day 11 isn't quite over yet, because while we do know who they are, it's important to understand why they're doing what they're doing. The next video will focus on the motivations of the Tsaritsa and the Harbingers, and what do the Harbingers have against the Divine. Anyway, my name is Aster, and thanks for chilling with me. Hope you enjoyed 2.1 and the events to come!